I didn't know you graduated from the University of Rome. No, actually, no. No, I, I've never been to a university in Rome. That was uh, a trip. We made it uh, together, myself and uh, your brother, Omar, on one of the uh, holidays, just like today, um, Christmas 2016. And, uh, we, uh, and we were shopping, so we got it. It's very uh, bright. Yeah, yeah. But I like it, actually. The, the color is uh, it's not my favorite, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I like it anyway. What is your favorite color? Blue. 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 Yeah. You sent me a voice note at four in the morning. Yeah. Now, thankfully, my phone is off. So it didn't wake me up. Unthankfully, <laughs> I was awake 30 minutes later. I knew it, you turned it off. Yeah, but I woke up way too early, like you. I think I could feel it inside that there's something uh, wrong. For both of us, there's something wrong. And it, some of it is obvious, some of it may not be obvious. But uh, there's a, a reflection of how bad things are in the country and how bad things are emotionally. And I felt it's the right time to talk to you again. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people speak to us. We actually, almost eight years ago, to the day, we had a joint TV ex uh, experience on that sofa. Correct. So you were to the right. I was to the left. Uh, it was probably the most difficult day both of us have ever experienced. We were waiting for Omar. He was in the plane, coming from San Francisco. It was hours after the assassination. And this, uh, this apartment uh, quickly turned into a, almost like a, a TV experience. And I, I know both of us detached ourselves from that moment to pull yeah. through. Um, I wasn't here the whole time. I went to AUH, uh, I visited uh, Tariq Bader's family, his uh, immediate family. Um, but otherwise, I was in this apartment from early morning until late at night. And as time passes, more of those moments come back to me. They're slow, but they come back. But what I do remember is us being on, in the spotlight very quickly after something devastating that both of us have not overcome. A wise man wrote to me in an email, maybe hours after, if not days, I don't remember, but it was not that long after the assassination. He said, the idea that death heals with time strikes me as unpersuasive. He's right. He's right. Gets worse. That's true. Eight years have gone by. And it feels as bad, if not worse, now than it did around that time. Now, here's my question to you. Do you think that's because the spotlight has dimmed down? I remember feeling like I was on a TV show more than accepting what happened. I was on autopilot. I don't know if you had the same feeling. You know, Ronnie, uh, when I got the news of the death, uh, they called it then, it's a shock. And I believe, yes, it was a shock. It uh, shocked me, but it shook me. It shook me for about two years. I was functioning as a widow, living my life alone, waiting for him to come back, uh, waiting for his calls. Yes, I knew inside of me that he's gone, but yet I was waiting. So this mixed feeling, stayed with me for about two years. 
um, later on I got busy involved with my family with you guys you and your brother Omar with my friends you tend to forget for a while but then you come back to the same story back again to him when I opened the closet his closet when I sleep in my bed we had one bed we shared one bed when I entered the house and not seeing him around on the sofa waiting for me when I uh, when I need a question that needs to be answered right away, right then on the spot. He was there for me. When I have my coffee in the morning, before he start our day, he was there for me, with me. Uh, when I have a problem that needs to be solved in a way or another regarding issues, uh, uh, children's issues, regarding family issues, friends issues, even social issues, even political issues. He was the one there for me. So uh, yes, now I feel I lost part of me, to tell you honestly. Uh, the good part of me, the, uh, the peaceful part of me, the uh, nice gentle part of me the one who kept me busy throughout my life now i feel my life is empty i need to uh, uh, fill it up on my own he was filling it up for me so yes you guys you added some life to my misery I am uh, more than thankful uh, you keep in touch, you come over, you visit, you never wanted to leave me alone. Uh, that was something that's really rewarding. But uh, I miss him, I miss my man. I miss my partner, I miss my childhood friend, I miss my uh, teacher, certain time in my life. I, uh, I miss his jokes, sometimes silly jokes, but jokes. He's gone. When I miss him, I go alone sometimes, where he's buried. And I cry just to let it out of my system, this anger. I have his pictures all around the house. I look at him, sometimes I blame him. Yes, sometimes I curse him. <laughs> why he wanted to, why he wanted to come back to a country where accountability is not there, doesn't exist, where freedom of speech, you get rewarded by being killed, just like the others who got killed before him. Why didn't you leave when I asked you several times to leave? And I pressured it, and I pushed it, and I tried my best to do it, especially when we started getting threatening, either letters or calls. I don't blame him why he didn't protect himself, because it's useless. When they want to kill, they have their ways to kill. They killed many people before. They killed Rafir Hariri before. 
Rafi al Hariri, I point at him as Rafi al Hariri because he had the most utmost security. Yet when they wanted to kill him, they got him one ton of TNT. In Muhammad's case, to each his own uh, weight. Muhammad's 50 kilos. Mashadia, they let her uh, 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 survive it with maybe 10, 20 kilos. This is the way it is, unfortunately. My experience is in some ways your experience too, and in some ways different. And I think that's natural because everyone comes to terms with something this devastating in a way that makes sense to them. And I think if you take the circle larger, uh, maybe depending on what kind of relationship that person had, they move on on their terms. And some people, I think, are better at it, and some people find it too difficult. Um, and I think it would be impossible to simply turn off that switch. I, I tried leaving for a few years. I left for almost four years. I tried that. I thought, you don't want to stay in a place that hurts this much without it driving you insane. I made a decision that, to me, did not work. Uh, it doesn't feel better to be away from this place. So that was something I did not know. Maybe it took me some time to come to terms with that, that despite how bad this event was, it didn't shake my relationship to this place which I think is important. So that for me is, uh, I experienced that. I tried not thinking about him. And there were a few days, but it's a few. I can count them on one hand where I didn't think about that event. I realize I'm not thinking about that event when I think about it again. No. That, that Oh, it's been 24 hours, maybe a little longer sometimes, but not, these are there are maybe less than five, five times in eight years. So you imagine uh, it's a daily experience. Oftentimes it's an hourly experience. Um, I miss him obviously in a very intimate way. I miss not just having a, a father who would be alive still. He's, he'd be 70, so he would be alive. Um, He'd be, I think, in his case, in his prime, because the later yeah. in life, he was shining. That's so true. I'm 100 percent sure he'd be very, he'd be okay inside. Whether or not this country's doing well or not is something else. But uh, I think he would be shining. He'd be in his element. And I also realized that I had only really one friend. I didn't have more. I have people in my life that I'm, I have friends, but I had one real friend, one true friend. Somebody that I could, it wasn't, it was a reflection. And I think uh, I have not adjusted to that situation. Yeah, that, it was not a father yeah. for you guys. He was more like a friend and a real friend. That's true. He always treated you as friends. Even when you were young. Very early stage in your life. He would talk to you like uh, immature people. Uh, when he addresses uh, like a subject or uh, a topic uh, to you guys, he's... Uh, same way addressing it to any other friend in his life. Yeah, he was a special father. I understand that. I know that. That's the part that that is impossible to move on from. That's true. 
I have, I didn't, you shared a bed with him for... 45 years. 45 years. There's something about that that I cannot imagine. Having, I was married for two years. I lived with a woman for the better part of maybe seven years, six or seven years. Um, I can't imagine 45 years and then having that removed. Seven years for me is already enough of a transition. I, can't I put pillows yeah. on his place. Yeah. I want to go back, though, because you have, the per you have certain memories that I don't have. And that's because you're my mother. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately or unfortunately. <laughs> There's that, what is that saying? Uh, you can't choose your relative, you can't pick your family? No. <laughs> yeah. We're being polite to each other. <laughs> you were in your teenage years when, when you first met? When I met him, I was 14 years old. You were 14. He would have been 17 or 18? Se 17 and a half. 17 and uh, a half. There is three and a half, uh, uh, three years and a half difference between him and me. You know, it's funny how it's just what almost half a century around that where now you can't get away with that <laughs> yeah, no. yeah he's my uh, he's the only man i knew uh, in my life yeah well then that's good there's no secrets coming out in this episode all right uh you you were you were a kid you're both kids 17 is not an adult so you're both children teenagers uh and you dated throughout school, and you were still a couple when he went to AUB. Yeah. For the most part, not yeah. maybe not the whole time, but but you stayed a couple for most of those years. Actually, every weekend he would go back to Tripoli, not spending it in Beirut. So he was living in Beirut, and for for yeah to attend university, and then in the and weekend, the weekend in Tripoli. Yeah. To see each other over coffee or going to movies, and that's it. Uh, this is the end of it. <laughs> so it was a proper Tripoli relationship. <laughs> Very much indeed. I never asked you this question. Do you remember the first time you met? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so explain it as much as possible. Okay. Uh, my father. Your grandfather uh, works in the uh, in a company called IPC, Iraq Petro Petroleum Company. It's a British company, was run by the British, and uh, they uh, have uh, you know events. Uh, they do events every now and then, and there was something called Square Dance every Thursday at night. Uh, all members with their families, they get together, and you can invite friends. And it's a square dance, literary square dance, where it's a circle, and we all sit around the circle. And the DJ, which would be one of the staff people, uh, and uh, music, and uh, drinks, and uh, dinner, and what have you, and uh, we dance. So your first encounter, you danced. And he was there as a guest, being invited by one of his cousins, that his father happened to work there too. So yes, that was the first dance. <laughs> and so you're 14? I was 14. I was briefly. This is a long time ago, but can you remember what you thought about this relationship then as a teenager. Did you think that this was going to lead to something serious? Or did you? I didn't know. You didn't know, because you're young. I didn't know anything. I didn't know where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> it's leading towards come, what? Come just a little closer, yeah. I didn't know it was leading towards what. Uh, you know, that was not the issue. Yeah. The issue is that I fell in love with him. And the issue is that he fell in love with me. Uh, now, uh, 
we were not planning. We were not. We're, the plan is to see each other. So you spent years just yeah. seeing each other on weekends. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yes. Until the last year, which was 1975. In 1975, the summer of 1975, where he got pretty sure that the situation in Beirut is not uh, lasting. Uh, is heading towards chaos. Uh, several times he would go down to Beirut to attend uh, a class or something in a university. Uh, he's not able to make it because burning tires on the road, because of uh, uh, blockage here, there. So uh, in the summer he decided to, that's it, to stop it and to go along on a different plan. That, uh, so the months when the civil war began. That was 1975-76. Right, so 75, uh, April, the civil war starts. AUB, I would guess, keeps going until June or so. He kept going to Beirut in those yeah, two months? Yeah, hmm. but at the same time, not able to sometimes make it yeah. on time. Or sometimes he's in Beirut, not able to make it back to Tripoli. Right. So uh, that was, uh, and mind you, um, I remember him, uh, like uh, sometimes when we're having coffee together, some friends would drop by and uh, have coffee with us. And I remember him uh, saying uh, many times, we're heading towards war. So sorry, this is after the civil war started or? Before. Bef before. No, before. no, before, before. Uh, we are heading towards war. Now, many, in, many people, including me, uh, not understanding what does he mean by war? Uh, uh, what kind of war, what war? Uh, but he was clearly a man that uh, was able to uh, to analyze uh, and not I don't want to say forecasting, but he was able to see clearly the world better than many others, uh, including even then politicians and uh, writers, what have you. He was able to predict, he was capable. And mind you, the information he was getting uh, from is uh, either on a radio or on a TV at uh, seven o'clock uh, news. Uh, we were not bombarded, bombarded by uh, information just like today. Yeah. So, uh, but he was, he would read a lot, he would analyze a lot. I remember him telling me uh, many times, not everything you read is right. You have to use your brain. Pick the right thing and throw away the wrong, the, uh, uh, wrong thing. So he was able to analyze. He was capable to uh, see the world in a, in a very clear eye. And that's what made him uh, successful in life. So in his early 20s, mm. and you're maybe 18, 19, he's talking to you about politics. Oh, yeah. That was when we were dating. When you're dating. Uh, now, I'm going to guess that everyone was talking about politics because we're always talking about politics yeah. in this country, even when there's not much to, I mean, <laughs> to talk about. We're, that's the obsession on any given day. But he's he's young and you're very young. I mean... You're both students. He's a university student. You're a high school student. Do you, th when you had those conversations with him, did you ever imagine that he would turn into a politician? Not, not a traditional politician, because he never really was a traditional politician. But I meant that he would serve a function in Lebanese politics. Not did at all. Not at all. What did you imagine? Because he's an economics student at AUB. Uh, who would uh, be a professor in mm. universities. What did, he, what did he say And when you had these conversations with him? Did he ever say what he would like to do later in life? I don't As know. An, I know it was not the topic to, to Did he talk express about. interest in a job? 
I, I'm asking because I know that he left. Oh, to, oh, yeah. oh. Uh, when he was maybe sophomore, hmm. there was a company called uh, a bank, Merrill Lynch, in Beirut, and he applied. Hmm. Okay. And he got accepted. But then he found out that it's uh, too much of courses and uh, work, bank work. So he declined it. Oh, so he would work while studying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then uh, when he was done with his BA, before making this transition into going to the States, for about four months, he tried it in Saudi Arabia. And uh, he didn't like it then because it was uh, it was not then a livable country for a couple. So that's... And he tried... After he graduated for yeah, the bachelor's? Yeah, okay. yeah. And he tried for about another three or four months again in Germany. Right, yeah. Where he went, he had an uncle there. He went there and he wanted to, and he had to study a little bit of German. Uh, but obviously he rejected it, he didn't like it. So he wanted to come back and that's what he made uh, his decision to go to America. So he came back during the Civil War? Yeah, yeah. In 76? Yeah, the Civil War had started and, uh, and remember the Civil War, the first two years were called civil war but not knowing that it's a civil yeah, war yeah. you know we were uh, just living it not knowing uh, uh, what to call it so uh, yeah the the civil war had started and uh, and that's it beirut for us it's not any more uh, solution to our uh, studies. I needed to go to university. I needed to finish my studies. He needed to finish his studies. And there was no way. Here, uh, actually here at the AUB, there is just a master's uh, degree. The PhD doesn't exist. Right. So he had so, started his master's, wasn't able to finish it because it was, uh, the, I think... Th that's when the chaos That's when the war started. started, yeah. When he was in Saudi Arabia and Germany, did you think that you're going to be with this man? You know, it's, it's weird. <laughs> but I really, now in retrospect, when you ask me something like this, I try to tend to think. But then I was not thinking. Exactly. So I'm trying to go back into your mind when this guy that you've been dating for high school years is moving around the world and about to settle on the on a move to the US. Is it something you just went along with? Inertia. Inertia, <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, was there any pressure from your family at that stage to say get married to him and go? No. Were they no. trying to on get you contrary, out of the country? On the contrary, they wanted uh, to stop this relation oh, because yeah. we were too young. Right. We were too young to make any sort of a decision. Hmm. Uh, no, no, they were, I guess, it, uh, for, for, for real reason, yeah. for now I understand why, uh, for a very, very legitimate reason, but, uh, he proposes in 1976. Yes. And you say yes. He didn't propose. I didn't say yes. It was a yes. <laughs> it was a yes all along. No, but okay. So these are things I don't know. You were you were married when you left Lebanon. We got married and we left. Yeah. You got married and you left. I know nothing about this marriage. You don't talk about it. There's no photos of it. There's no documents to show that you're married. No, there are photos. Are there photos? You don't share them. Okay. <laughs> The, the album. Okay, no, but f I mean, there's no. I don't know about the marriage because I think the reason you don't talk about it, you don't talk about it, is because it's probably not the kind of marriage you wanted to have. It's the marriage that just gets you out Absolutely of the country. Absolutely not. I would, I would 
tell you honestly. No, I, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean the relationship. I meant the ceremony is not the ceremony. No, we no, wanted. we didn't have ceremony. Right. No, no, that. no, not at all. No, no, uh, they wanted us to leave as soon as possible. Actually, we didn't leave from Beirut uh, airport. We left from Syrian airport, so from you, Damascus. So what, was it a religious ceremony? No, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They call it Katb uh, So you did the Katb Okay. I don't know any... I, in, yeah. in your grandparents' house, in my parents' house, they did it. In your... In, your in, in, my, your in home. my parents' house. Yeah. We did it, and uh, then we went for a honeymoon in Turkey, and uh, we came back through Damascus. Uh, I have photos of that honeymoon. I've seen pictures of your honeymoon in Turkey. In Turkey. What strikes me is how young both of you look yeah. in these photos. Yeah. So young. Yeah. I wouldn't trust this couple to do anything right. They, they're young. They're so... I mean, I'm being a little... I'm being silly, but you really look like your kids. You're in your 20s. Early, you're, I think, maybe 19 or 20. Then 18. 18, 18, okay. So you're making huge decisions at 18, whether or not you want to live with this person and leave Lebanon. And you say yes. You know, Ronnie, uh, then, and even for very long time after your dad was a friend more than a a husband was a dear friend was a brother was a father was a mother uh, to me Don't look at our relation, the marital uh, relation, as the uh, one and only, uh, the ones we, you you know, of, uh, you know, how people, they get married and blah, blah, and they plan, and it was not like that. It was not like that. It was, we call it in French, a coup de foudre. For both of us. What does that mean? It's I got struck by him. He got struck mm. by me. Mm. And that's the end of it. So there is no planning, so to speak, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I know for him, it's it was like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we got married not knowing what marriage is all about. <laughs> When you left Lebanon together, when you left in 1976 and you went to Texas, did you think that that was a goodbye? Was that a, uh, you're letting go of Lebanon? No, no, no. No. Uh, No. Were you planning on returning earlier than when you actually did in the 90s? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, when we left to uh, the States, that was my promise to my parents and uh, our yeah. Uh, promise myself and uh, Muhammad to my parents just to let them feel good better by the separation of physical separation from me to them uh, that uh, we'll go there we'll finish our studies we'll come back I see so that would have been just maybe four to six years or so uh, four years four years and then you'd come back and then we come back and then by then the the war would have ended and uh, life goes on i think a lot of people have that story yeah that they didn't know they would be leaving unfortunately in in our case it was uh, harder uh, and harsher you know it uh, it would hit you uh, uh, really deep being separated from your environment your parents your uh, peers you end up being in an unknown place, a strange place, different than your culture. Uh, yes, you adapt. Yes, you make it uh, hopefully better. Yes, you are uh, with your partner and all uh, the good uh, things. But there is this bad thing where you would, it would take you a month to reach out to your parents by either a phone call that doesn't work, 
many times by a letter that takes one to two months to reach you by uh, uh, you know knowing what the hell is going on in your country uh, for uh, Muhammad because of his curiosity to know more about Lebanon he would go to a library happened to uh, be uh, in Austin Lyndon B. Johnson Library he would go there and literally go to the archives and uh, searching for maybe a newspaper somewhere somehow talking about Lebanon it's I remember there was Nahar and Anwar, uh-huh. where where he would uh, be able to find the news that happened last month. It's incredible how things have changed so much. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I as mean, far as technology, absolutely. Technology and even that you don't have to be disconnected anymore. You can leave absolutely. for a year and still be as absolutely as in tune with what's happening. Actually, I remember, uh, yeah, of course, and uh, actually everybody knows now, like sometimes uh, you would call me or uh, your, uh, or Omar would call me and uh, the night of your traveling and then you come over the next day and uh, it's a follow up thing. Yesterday you told me the same story. Now you're, you're, you know, yeah, you're yeah, yeah. talking it's to as me if, about right, right, as so, if yesterday yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw you or talked to you. Which makes it less difficult to leave Absolutely. these days. So you you had to basically throw yourself into a brand new environment. You have no Lebanese connections around you. Not at all. And I'm trying to think, you know, that, that is so challenging for you. Do you have any reflections on him in those years? Was it something easy for him to adjust to? Okay. Because, no. because I'm asking, he did spend a few months in Germany and Saudi Arabia, but that's not really living abroad for no, long. No, no, In the States, the thing that worked really better for him, and that's why he chose the States, not Paris it's or he had Europe. siblings. Because of, uh, of uh, uh, his background coming from an ev- uh, evangelical school. He knows English. Oh. He is yeah, fluent yeah, yeah. in uh, language. Yeah. His brother is there. His, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, you know, the professors that he got encountered with, they're almost similar like the professors he got mm. encountered in uh, at the AUB. So you think that was the easier transition it was for him? Much easier, yeah. knowing where the hell, you know, uh, knowing where the hell he's heading. In my case, I was following. Right. I was a follower. Because you didn't speak English fluently Absolutely then. Absolutely not. And he was okay. He could get by easily. Yeah, some, yeah, many times. I stayed for about like a year or uh, or so, uh, sitting next to him, asking him what did he say, yeah, what yeah, yeah. did she say. Um, we, uh, like, um, we had a couple, uh, very much Americans, and uh, and I remember... I would ask her, very much Texans, uh, I would ask her, please uh, just uh, s- talk slowly. I'm not able to follow. Uh, and uh, They would laugh. He would uh, translate it to me. So I would feel more at ease being him around me. That's when we decided that said I should be on my own. And I should go and attend uh, uh, a school where they teach English as a foreign language. And I excelled. Yani, thank God, I did very well. And he was very happy. And I wanted to please him. I wanted to please myself. You know, remember, you're, when you're in, the, in your 20s, it's not like uh, when you're in your uh, 60s or 70s. So everything was new and I was able to Make it good. Make it better. <laughs> now you're talking about yourself now. <laughs> now uh, I just understood what you're saying. <laughs> now there's no yeah. shot in hell there will be any improvements anytime soon. No, I. but you're... Okay, so you're adjusting to a new country. You're, yeah. you're adjusting to a new language. It was, it was very... Uh, uh, very... Uh, uh, intriguing, yeah. you know, knowing... Uh, but your relationship to America is evolving. 
his relationship to Le- to America is maybe smoother because he already has some yeah. foundation. Lebanon obviously is on his mind because he's going to the library. He doesn't have to. He's going through archives. He's trying to catch up on Lebanese news. So he has an inclination towards what's happening in Lebanon. Um, in your conversations then, was he talking about Leban- Lebanon the way he talked about it later in life? So in his my, my relationship to him and the Lebanese stuff is he's there's a depth to what he's saying. There's an understanding that's unusual. He can connect dots that are not easy to connect. He's all, almost looking at it as if he stood away from it and he's on top seeing it for what it yeah. is and explaining it in a way that's very easy to understand. Was I mean in his in his university years when he talks about Lebanon, is it a narrower sort of no. more innocent? No, you know, the Americans, mind you, uh, or at least the people we got uh, to know uh, and uh, socialize with, they were very eager and curious to know about Lebanon. Mm. Now remember the information. Mm-hmm is not there for them. Mm-hmm. It's not Google where you can search it, right? <laughs> yeah. Or even uh, on TV. Or it's even, not... there was no CNN yeah. even. And even the news on Lebanon. Un- unless something really yeah. de- devastating happened. Or if it's related to America. Or I mean, if the a- m- embassy the being embassy, bombed. Or, the, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, so they were really, really curious to know more about Lebanon. Why? because it's a civil war and it was called then a civil war between Christians and Muslims. Mm -hmm. So the curiosity is more uh, uh, to know. Uh, It's uh, Palestinians involved, uh, it's Muslims involved. It's uh, so this whole thing gets there, reaches there where uh, it's very much misleading sometimes. The geography of Lebanon, the location of Lebanon, where Lebanon is, uh, which part of the region is. Remember, the Americans are not so much uh, eager to know more beyond the uh, the states, the 50 states uh, uh, of America. Uh, so, yeah, he was, and they would be really happy. And, uh, and sometimes, I would learn from his explanation because sometimes yeah, many things that he would be talking about, I didn't see them or didn't feel them or don't know them. So I was learning a lot so from he, him. He, I mean, his, it's not that many years. I mean, he's, he left in his early 20s and he's able to explain the Lebanese story to a foreign audience while he's away from yeah. Lebanon. So there's obvious, there's a passion there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the passion of Lebanon never, never left Muhammad. Never. I'm going to go back just one step, Lawada, and then we can catch up. But did he, before you made the decision to leave because of the war, did he think about leaving in any conversation you had together? Prior to 1975, did he want to pursue his studies abroad no, he was, you know, had it, had we not gone into civil war or not able to reach Beirut uh, University or in the university there is a PhD program, I think Muhammad would have stayed. He would have stayed, yeah. I'm, I'm asking because I'm thinking, trying to think back, you both would have probably just lived a Lebanese life. Oh, yeah, here. yeah. So America is just because of the civil war. A step out. Yeah. But it was never a never the never a desire to just leave Lebanon no, and no. find your lives elsewhere. It's like the same uh, for the same reasons why most of the uh, Lebanese found their way in Saudi Arabia to make yeah. their end living, and uh, yeah. and Saudi Arabia was blossoming and booming, and uh, they wanted to go there and work there. In his case, he tried it. But then he wanted to uh, pursue his uh, his studies. He ended up being in Texas. 
So it's nice to know that he's trying to explain Lebanon mm -hmm. while he's that's pop, why he's that's 15, why. almost 15 years younger than me in America, eager to think and, and actually I sometimes see part of him in you and part of him in uh, Omar in a different way because I've yeah, I am the only witness <laughs> between you and uh, your father and mm. Omar and his father I lived both you know both uh, uh, situations I've known him when he was 18. Right. So, uh, so you're now almost 40. So, yeah. So I know. We met when I was around 18 as well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so, you know, yeah. yeah. So I see a lot of similarities between you guys and him. He graduates from Texas. Yeah. The Civil War is raging. And you both move to Washington, D.C., to the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and he's working at the IMF. He's passionate about Lebanon. He's in the economics field in Texas. He's about to work at the IMF in a mostly economics-related position. Lebanon is sort of taking a step back. No, let me tell you here, there is a hint. Uh, now, luckily for him, at the IMF, his job mm, mm. was assistant to an executive director that happened to be Mr. Mohammed Fnesh. Mr. Mohammed Fnesh is in Libya. And in that, at this post is by election, country. Mm -hmm. uh, they pick country and they pick the, the, the person that belongs to this country. So Libya was the, uh, uh, the seat was for Libya. And Mohammed Fnesh was a Libyan. So, uh, and his job, Mohammed's job, and the job of this group, the assistant, the alternate, the uh, executive director, it was involved with eight different countries, Arab, uh, Arab, uh, Arabic countries. Lebanon is one of them. Mm -hmm. And which would give Muhammad the uh, the uh, uh, opportunity to come and visit Lebanon several times. Oh, so that he knew when he got the, when he took yeah, the yeah, job yeah, that yeah, this yeah, was. Yeah. I see. So Lebanon is, is accessible through that work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He would come for a visit, just like now. You would hear about the IMF people coming over to do this yeah. and that. I see. So there was. He was already looking at how to find his way back. And uh, he was uh, involved in, uh, in uh, eight other countries. Lebanon was one of them. And uh, he knew Prime Minister uh, Fouad Senora. They've known each other for about 20, 30 years. Because um, Prime Minister Senora was at certain time was he really a finance uh, minister so they knew uh, uh, he he that's in the 90s yeah that that's was later, later on yeah, yeah. but uh, i mean uh, early before yeah so that's a job that is a he, met, he met several times with uh, uh, prime minister Hoss, if i remember correctly during the war yeah. so okay so he was getting involved in a less indirect way, but mostly on the economic side. Mostly economic, studies, finance. Yeah. So that is his career in the U.S. Um, now it stayed for about seven years. Right. Yeah, and he went from two years later. He became an advisor to Mr. Finish, and Mr. Finish got reappointed. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, an advisor would give him more of a privilege to do uh, many other things, talking on the board, uh, lecturing here, convincing this country, that country. So he got more and more involved on the economic uh, side. So that's an IMF job 
that gives him some access to Lebanon. Yeah. And it's slowly, slowly becoming a more political role. No. Slowly. No. Not, not in the Lebanese politics, more in that policy. Not There's even. Not even. Not even. No, no. At the IMF, one of the rules, and they are very strict on this, you would not inv get involved in politics, hmm. none whatsoever. I see. You so don't show on TV. You don't talk in the media. You don't speak on the media. You don't write uh, hmm. in newspapers. Hmm. Hmm. They're very strict, strict about politics. That doesn't mean that you become ignorant about politics. You know, sorry, I meant it. You're right. I meant political economy so that he could get into the policy making realm, not just uh, not just numbers, that there's uh, there's room for him when it comes to stabilizing Lebanon. Through no, the of course, he would. Yeah, he would talk to uh, to finance minister. That, sorry, that's or what I prime meant. minister. Yeah. But he's not the uh, decision maker. Sure, but it's not a desk job at the IMF. It's a outreach, and there's some connections being established. So, you have that road which is gradually going back towards Lebanon, even when there's no road yet. I mean, it's still during the civil war. I'm going to fast forward a bit before we jump into the 90s. I recall. Uh, many many mornings in the u.s growing up this is this actually maybe in the 1980s maybe late 80s so it could be around this time actually he would talk and talk and talk and talk he assumed i was interested i mean i'm maybe eight years old nine years old i'm young maybe a little older so the early 90s he would talk and talk and talk and talk about lebanon everything from the war to the groups involved, to dates. He was make, He was almost like giving a course on Lebanese history and politics and economy to his son in the mornings, on the weekends. Yeah. That, and I, you, I mean, I can remember him being so happy to do this, but it's a bit odd when you're that, that into the Lebanese story and you're growing up in the U.S. to have a father who's that passionate about Lebanon. So it's there. It's it's obvious. One of those stories, and I don't know if he would talk about this with you that often, was really a terrible story about they're almost back to back. One that he's getting up to go to the kitchen. He comes back to where he was see sitting in the living room and there's bullets sprayed all across the chair that he was sitting in. So obviously somebody across the street or a building shot into the apartment and within a minute or so he would have been dead. So he had, he had, there were bullet holes in a chair he was sitting in. Another one is a friend of his and I think this is a friend either from school or maybe not from school, from Tripoli. Uh, somebody who was in the army yeah. and was tied up. Helicopter. Helicopter, yeah, tied up and driven yeah. around the streets of Beirut, uh, Tripoli, uh, until he was just bones. Yeah. And that's, I think, Fatah, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember exactly. And maybe his friend was either affiliated with Kate'ib or I don't remember what the story is exactly, but it's not, um, it's a political. He's Christian. Christian Muslim. Kuwaiti. Okay. And then we were. Uh, fighting each other uh, to his heart and uh, Tripoli. And he happened to be the way his heart. Yeah. A close friend of his. A is lot, a lot of, yeah. yeah. So these are stories he's sharing. When it's very painful for him. Very yeah. painful for all of us. Yeah. Uh, and I also remember that he was very sad when his mother, my grandmother, passed away and he was in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Not able to be next yeah. to her. I actually think that's one of the few times I saw him cry. Yeah. As as somebody talking about the country, there's shining stories and then there's just scarring stories. And then I, I remember this. Maybe in the early 90, 1992, maybe early 1993. It's just a, out of nowhere, a sort of a shocking news pack up we're moving to Beirut and very 
sudden departure from the U.S. back to Lebanon. I've had conversations with you about this. And I think over time you've you've spoken more about it, that you went along with it, but you were not completely, you were not okay with it. Absolutely not. Can you take me back, take me back to 10 years of the U.S., or more actually, more 15 years of the U.S.? 17. 17 years. 10 years at least in Washington, D.C., in the IMF. And an opportunity for him to return to Lebanon and work at the Central Bank. Can you remember the conversations you had together? And you know how passionate he is all the time about Lebanon. You know that that's a job he would want. Um, And at the same time, it's not a move you want. No, he had a better job. He had a better job and uh, he had a much more secure job. He had a much better environment in the job itself. He had uh, more uh, of peace of mind there. And being a good father and being a very, very caring father, we, we, were, we were both very anxious to uh, raise you in an environment where it's satisfying to all of us. And of course, here, being a country, uh, getting out of a, of a war, not knowing really that the war is ended, has ended. Uh, That's actually well said. It was not 100% sure we yet. We were not sure. Yeah. We would have checkpoints still uh, on the way to Beirut. He, that trip, which I remember, it's the first trip back to Beirut in yeah. 1991. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I know this because I'm old enough to remember it, but he seemed so happy. Yeah. Really happy to be back. I was taking videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's 15 years of not seeing a place he loves. And he sees it in destroyed, war-torn, bad shape. And he's happy. He's really happy. I get the feeling that your relationship to Lebanon is if you remove him from the equation that it's a, just a completely different relationship to this country so you, you're able to detach Lebanon on your terms I don't think he could even though what you're saying the way you're describing it is that you want what's best for your children you're going up in a safer environment in a healthier environment a job that is better more you secure know. I uh, don't want to talk about me. We're talking about uh, that. Well, both, both. Both. Uh, no, I don't have this passion. Maybe because I know the country better. See the result. I don't want to challenge this. I don't this. want to challenge this, and I don't want to dig into this. Yeah, yeah no, I, no I, sorry, I didn't. I don't want to challenge you on what you feel, but I will. Th- I think this is speculating. It's that this country can be in good shape or bad shape. He would still have the same type of relationship with it. I don't in, think it, in bad shape abroad. No, he won't. He won't live here. Bad shape in the sense of civil war. Uh, yeah, he yeah. would leave definitely. Right. Yeah. Well, you did. You didn't uh, stay in Tripoli. Yeah. Yeah. What's not clear is how long the Syrian presence will last. I think that sort of took Correct. A, none of us anticipated 15 years of Syrian We still had some checkpoints. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, all over. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, they were everywhere throughout the country. But not just checkpoints. I mean, in terms of political damage Baba. continued. He obviously becomes a better known figure simply because he's a central bank vice governor. That's not a political job, but it's putting him in the spotlight. Post-war reconstruction, he's friends with many characters that we come to know well, not just in Lebanese context, but even some of them are family friends. Uh, I met Bessif Lehan 
in the early 1990s. In the States. Washington, D.C. I met Nadim Munla probably in the 80s. In the States. In the States. Uh, I met actually a lot of the characters that we were Jihad familiar Azor. with. Many of the, uh, many of yeah. the D.C. IMF crowd had also returned around Even, this time. Even uh, Shahadi. Shami. 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 Saadi Shami. Shahadi. Shahadi. Yeah. Uh, Shahadi. Saad Shami. Saad Shami. I hope that's right. Saad Shami. Yes, yeah, Saad, Saad Shami. We should know his name if we're friends with him. <laughs> yeah. No, but we, we 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 knew all the IMF. Sure. People, yeah. Okay, so it's a natural uh, decision for many people to come back to Lebanon. So yeah. in a way, he's not doing something no 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 unusual. No. Yeah. You make it known that you're not happy with the situation. It doesn't change the facts that you move back. Okay. No 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 no. Mind you, no. I stayed here, and we tried to make the best out of it. We attended all the events that's related to banks, to economics and banking, mm -hmm. not politics. So in the years that he was here as a vice governor, the, the, it's still an economics-related job. Yeah. But by 1997, it's a exit economics and enter diplomacy uh, enter diplomacy yeah. yes because he is hired He's he was appointed appointed not hired you're right it's not a company he was appointed thank you that's one of the first times you're and the last time and the only time <laughs> that yes you're right it's good it happened once he was appointed by uh, Prime Minister Rafi Hariri. Right. So Hariri's Prime Minister, uh, the previous ambassador to the U.S., his name escapes me now. Mr. Tabara. Thank you, Tabara. Yes, was, uh, his tenure ended, and my father becomes ambassador. Those years in the U.S. You're As an ambassador? Yes. You're returning to America in a very different outfit. You're not a student in Texas. You're not learning the ropes in Washington, D.C. as an economics and, I mean, it's not going to America. It's going to Lebanon in America. Because, I am, exactly. Yeah. I am now the wife of the uh, ambassador of Lebanon that's representing Lebanon, the good image of Lebanon. With Lebanon getting out now of its chaotic situation being rebuilt here by Prime Minister Rafi Hariri. So Muhammad was the, the uh, reflection of the work of Prime Minister Hariri ho, uh, here in the States. There's something else which I've, uh, I've covered in different ways, um, but I haven't really said it in this way before. Um, I'm young, but I'm aware of what's going on. So I'm not a kid. I'm turning into an adult. You were 15, 14, 15 By the time old. we left, 18 or so. Yeah. So, I, I mean, at least university age or close to that, where I'm aware that there are problems that I wasn't aware of when I was younger. And I think children, anywhere they are, they don't see the reality they're kids yeah. they shouldn't actually that's that's part of the experience being a kid um, suddenly I was more aware of Syria's role in Lebanon than I was when I lived here even though you saw it here you experienced it here um, you felt it here but there it was almost a there are there's there are walls around Lebanon and that's in Washington DC in the embassy there were lines being drawn. Uh, either this was difficult conversations with Lebanese officials. There was pressure to keep Lebanon within Syria's orbit. Mm. And, I mean, whether it's somebody like Feris is who has a policy that's opposed to what Hadidi wanted, but was not expressing openly, hmm. was not a, was not the vocal critic of Syria. He was quietly in the back, in the background. He was a foreign minister then. Boyes was foreign minister, right? But I mean, uh, Hadidi was not vocal 
and his criticism of the Syrian regime. I think no, no one was in Lebanon. No. But behind the scenes, there were things that were happening. And one of those examples is the U.S. Uh, experience, the Lebanon, uh, Lebanese ambassador in the U.S., who clearly wants to restore Lebanon's sovereignty. There's even a great uh, magazine article, I remember it, maybe it's somewhere here. Uh, that's the title of the piece, Restoring Lebanon's Sovereignty. And it's a photo of dad with an article about him. Yet the country is not sovereign. The Israelis are still in the south. The Syrians are throughout the country. Uh, Hezbollah is not the same Hezbollah that it is now, but there is one militia that's operating outside of the state control. So this is an ambassador in those confines. And I remember that becoming almost, um, there's only so much you can do. There isn't much more. And I remember him really trying to do all that he could in that circle, which included helping lifting the ban on Americans That's visiting uh, Lebanon, which also helped establish ties that had broken during the Civil War. And things we take for granted now that you can even do a booking, an airline booking from Beirut to the mm. U.S. without having this European intermediary. Things that took time. The banking sector reopened. Uh, he was pushing as far as he could, but there was a wall. That was the Syrian regime. Feris Boyes was maybe the least important wall in that story, but that was a regular phone call. Walid Ma'allim, who was the Syrian ambassador to, uh, to, uh, to the U.S., was more or less a, almost a, you felt it, that there's friction. The Israelis are about to leave Lebanon. The Syrians are concerned. Their position is going to change in the country. They don't want to lose Lebanon. And you have an ambassador and you have a team here that's looking for an opportunity to finally move on from the civil war. All of this stops in 2000. The moment Hariri is forced out, uh, Emil Lahoud becomes president. I think Salim al Hus returns, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And the whole experience, sort of, there's a pause. Um, and dad goes back to the IMF. Hariri, I think, if memory serves me right, he wasn't prime minister again or maybe he was one more time before he tried running for elections in early 2005. Maybe he was a, a Briefly, parliamentary member. He was an MP, right? But he wasn't prime minister again. Um, I could be wrong here. He was prime minister twice, and he was campaigning for a third time. Uh, yeah, uh, so maybe that was... Uh, he was still on the scene, obviously, oh, yeah. but he was not... Uh, the momentum had stopped. Everything changes on February 14, 2005. Rafiq Hadidi is killed. Not just Rafiq Hadidi gets killed in that blast. Not just dozens of innocent people. A dear friend, Bastard Flehan, dies a month, uh, two months later in April from his burns. Uh, and I remember that this beautiful eulogy he shared about Bastard Flehan in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And the determination that there's no negotiation returning back to Lebanon. Can't see it any other way. And I remember these moments where he's trying to find a way out of the IMF in a diplomatic way so that it's not mm. problematic long term. And within a few months, he's back in Beirut. He visited in, uh, I believe it's April, and he was living here by June or July. So very quickly, shutting down the U.S. experience once again, moving back to Beirut. This apartment, if I remember correctly, was rented out. Yeah. So you're living in a uh, furnished apartment furnished. in Ashrafiyye, and everything is temporary, but the mission is clear. So he did not resign from the IMF then. Then, when he moved, when he decided to come back, and I remember he told me, let's give it a try back again. I told him, if it doesn't work, he said, we'll go back. We'll leave the house there, 
and I'm not, uh, I'm not resigning from the IMF. A few months later, it he was resigned. a decision. <laughs> no, I was with him in his office. He resigned. Trying to resign, and I remember these moments were tense. He went there and he resigned because if he doesn't resign, then he cannot enter the political scene. Mm -hmm. He cannot talk on the media. He cannot mm -hmm. uh, perform uh, as a as a so-called quote unquote politician. Right. These are important years. So 2005. By the summer, you're back. He's advising. He's a member. Uh, there, there's a team of advisors. He's one of those advisors, um, pursuing things that he believed all along that happened to also their aspirations that are shared by not just his friends and his colleagues, by millions of protesters. Correct. March 14 is in the background. And I think that momentum is what really drove a lot of people to give it one more try. It's a very dramatic year. It's a very dramatic year for Lebanon. The Syrian army left. The Syrian intelligence left. Lebanese are trying to figure it out on their own. And very quickly, it's obvious that there's going to be long-term problems. It's within months, if not shorter, we maybe weeks. We got involved in, in a war. No, no, that's, that's, that's July 2006. I'm talking about the summer of 2005 mm. until summer of 2006. But there's at least momentum. Momentum on the streets, and there's momentum in politics. Mistakes are made. Uh, Governments that are formed are not ideal, obviously. There's an opposition that shouldn't be there. Uh, there's friction and there's clarity in that the Syrians may have left cosmetically, but the infrastructure they built uh, is being taken over by Hezbollah. But nonetheless, these people are there and they're trying. A year later, summer of 2006, there have been multiple assassinations from Gibran Twaini in December of 2005, Samir Asir in June 2005, George Hevi as well. Uh, political assassinations are happening already. And then July 2006, it goes from that is the biggest threat to we're at war with Israel. And you and I spent that summer watching the bombs land all over southern Beirut and Dahri. And I went around working with Oxfam. I was distributing hygiene kits that whole summer. Uh, Dad was on the news every night and doing politics every day, every day. And some of these, some of these very risky endeavors, trying to find some negotiation for Hezbollah to finally move on from its wartime rule. There's the implementation of 1701, where Hezbollah is clearly sees an interest in signing on. And then by the end of that war, rejected. early October, on the complete opposite end. So the diplomacy with Hezbollah during the war didn't work. And Hezbollah's revenge begins. Now Hezbollah becomes the story. Syria was the story for many years. Between 2005, 2006, it was shifting to Hezbollah, but by that summer, it's Hezbollah's game. And that's where the diplomacy didn't work. I associate that in the years thereafter as being a diplomat. He was a real diplomat in, the wa in Washington, D.C. as an ambassador. And he did things here I know he didn't want to do. One example, he may be the most reluctant finance minister ever in Lebanese history. He really did not want to be finance minister. He really did not want to be a finance minister. I was afraid he would be reappointed. As finance minister, he, he despised even having that kind of uh, it was not his calling. He wanted to be, in a way, uh, more than that. He wanted to be a strategist. 
and a diplomat. These soft negotiations with Hezbollah went nowhere. Um, I don't know if the record will show this, but I don't think there would have been a Ba'abda declaration without him. I think Dad was instrumental in putting that together. That's real diplomacy. That's very, very, very uh, important consensus that once again Hezbollah signs on to. Just like 1701 in the summer of 2006 and 2012, they sign on to the Ba'abda Declaration mm -hmm. not to get involved in the Syrian war. Maybe within hours, they're involved in the Syrian war openly. Open. So there is no diplomacy with Hezbollah. Um, I think even though he was an advisor to both Saad Hadidi and Fuad Senyura, even though he was a diplomat appointed, as you said, uh, by Rafiq Hadidi as an ambassador to the U.S., even if he was suggested by Fuad Senyura and recommended maybe to a degree by Nadim Munda and was introduced to Rafiq Hadidi in the early 90s to be a vice governor for the Central Bank, I don't think those titles really fit him. He was a diplomat and very, very hell-bent on finding an agreement that could work. It didn't work. In 2012, I think it was clear that Hezbollah is not a Lebanese story. Hezbollah is something Lebanon cannot confront. Had it been a Lebanese story only, it would be solved. It's not. The last stretch of his life, he did something which is, I think, a first maybe for any Lebanese official. Not in power, he's an advisor to a prime minister who's not in Lebanon. And Saad Hadidi is out. He's still here, my father's still here, trying to reach out to Iran over Hezbollah, finding a way for Iran to reconsider what it sees as important to Iran, not to Lebanon. Writing a letter to Rouhani. Writing a letter to Rouhani, and not just that, talking about it in a way that was unusual. Maybe the Lebanese state mm. could vote this in. This could be a parliamentary procedure. He wanted to be uh, to present it to the uh, parliament. Yeah. To be signed by the... Uh, by the... Uh, uh, peace. So for me, for me, those that died paying the ultimate price and him, they're in a different category. Uh, they all tried and they all were killed trying. Uh, but going over Hezbollah to Iran on Lebanon's behalf, it hasn't been done since. And it may not be even feasible. But that's when he's killed. That's eight years ago. In the last eight years, we've both seen Lebanon tumble and fall into the abyss. And now we're in a country that is unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. It's unrecognizable to us that have lived here most of our lives now. We've seen what it looks like when it's being rebuilt in the post-war years. We see what it's like when it's dying. We know the Civil War. We know the post-war. We know this, and it's an ugly time. It's a tragic time. You're spending your last years on this planet in this country. Um, you've had all this time to think back on everything that happened. And we started off by saying this moment, this feeling gets worse over time. On a very individual level, on your terms, somebody who's still here, somebody who's still stuck to this story. Do you think it's over? What? What's over? The whole thing. The passion that could bring someone back to this country determination within this country to keep trying? No. Listen. Like Muhammad, like your dad, there exists. 
millions and millions here and abroad of Lebanese that are passionate about Lebanon. Not necessarily the same way like Muhammad, but to each his own different way. So the passion for this country exists ever since Lebanon existed. <laughs> That's true. It will stay until the end of the universe. <laughs> so as long as there is Lebanon, the way we know Lebanon. Now, yes, they can kill because they're cowards. They can kill and they can keep on killing because they're criminals. But who would win at the end? The right thing. It would take a long time to take your freedom and to be real independent, complete independent, needs sacrifice. We're sacrificing in a different way. We're counting on you, generation, and on the next generation. Our generation failed, just like our parents' generation, just like our great grandparents' generation. There is no way back. We're moving forward. The world is moving forward. Arabia is moving forward. The whole area is moving forward. Lebanon is part of this. The Lebanese people belong to this, uh, 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 to this uh, 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 blossoming uh, uh, era that I might call it. Uh, it's an era. It's you say this even when things are terrible here, that it's nonetheless, it's still there lo is long term. Always. 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 It's a never-ending story with Lebanese. I want to try to see if I understand you correctly. I would disagree on something. I wouldn't blame your generation or your parents' generation or my generation or any Lebanese generation, really, on what happened to this country. I say this, and I know, I know you'll probably disagree, and I know many people I speak to regularly don't think this is the case, but I believe this. I don't think anyone in this country did anything wrong. I think the circumstances given to Lebanon and the problems that are not Lebanon's are beyond our control. That could include Syria's management of the country. That could include, in the 1970s, the reasons you left this country, these militia that were not Lebanese. Look, can, can I just add one more thing, one more thing? Even trying to negotiate with Hezbollah the fact is, Hezbollah is not a Lebanese story. So these big problems that took Lebanon completely in reverse, I don't think any Lebanese generation could do more. Look, there is a question, a big question, and there are several other questions, uh, uh, sub-questions. There's a big question. Do we want a country? Uh, to each, uh, the question should be uh, asked from, uh, uh, demanded. Do you want a country? If you want a country, what do you want this country to be? You and I, different generations, we want, I think, more or less the same country. I want democracy. Okay. Democracy exists in this country. But it's not your fault. It's not you. I mean, can I say it in a different way? Anything you did or anything you could have done would not have changed the situation. There are problems in this country that originate in other places. No, no, it's our fault. We are, not we necessarily, me or him or her. Some people in this country like to play the role of the savior of some other countries. Lebanon, yes, Lebanon is for all Lebanese. And now I'm talking Muhammad's turn. I'm talking the language of Muhammad. Lebanon belongs to Akkar, Sunni. Belongs to Jnub, Shi'i. Belongs to Kisruel, Masihi. Al-Matni. 
بيلونغس تو شوف الدرسي وبيلونغس للبحر تن تن تنسافر ونهاجر هيدا لبنان لبنان هالقد هالقد سمول فيري سمول كونتري Let me try, because I, I, I think it's worth going down this road just way. These communities exist in this country with or without war. They're here. They're Lebanese, and they are all stuck in this situation together. I cannot blame the Sunnis for the PLO's wars in Lebanon. I cannot blame the Maronites for the Israeli invasion. Who allowed the PLOs to work like this so, in Lebanon? So, sorry, can I, I'll just finish my thought. I'll end it with what you're saying, but I just want to finish it. I don't blame the Maronites for, or the Shia of the South for hoping the Israelis would change the situation for the better. I don't blame the Shia for Hezbollah. I don't blame any community. I don't blame the Druze or the Shia or the Maronites or the Sunnis or whoever for the worst aspects of regional war in Lebanon. Now, obviously, Lebanese differences play a role in making these problems worse. There is no Lebanese differences. We get misled always. There is no Lebanese. We all, we all, we all want Lebanon. But some leaders hijacked Lebanon mm. to their own terms, mm, mm. to their own benefits, to their own interest. Mm. And unfortunately, this is a country where there is election. Mm. No, we don't lead a real election. In our country, there is no real election. There is bribery in the election. I hope we'll see a real election this time, if there is an election, if we are allowed to have an election. No, I, the Lebanese Sunni from Tripoli, and I, the Lebanese Shi'i from Bint Jbal, Naura, Arub, وآي د لبنيس المارونية بال بالمتن وكسروان وآي درزية بالشوف. We all see Lebanon the same way. We have the mind, we have the brain, we have the education, we have the the modern way of looking at the world. We were like this. We want it back. Why? Because all those people that got killed throughout the history of Lebanon wanted this. I will add to what you're saying. I'll interrupt you just a moment. Um, I think you're right that there are leaders, obviously, in this country that made things worse and took advantage of this country's problems to survive through war. And they obviously got themselves involved in regional wars, and they took advantage of that role, and they stuck around for your whole life, my whole life. That's two generations. They hijacked us. And I also think, you may see it differently, but um, maybe there's no real answer here, but I do think that what dad was trying to do in the last stages of his career that window for better or worse that window is the window and i think it's a tragedy that it's up to another country's people to let go of their nightmare and help us let go of our nightmare too and i think it's a sad reality that what iran needs from lebanon in the last 15 years especially, has meant killing Lebanese that loved this country and tried their best, even when they were trying to negotiate with that country. And uh, their security concerns are bigger than everything we've talked about. And one day, we will live to see Iran change. 
And I think I, I think the so. re the region is changing. I hope so. The region is changing in some ways for the better. The temperature will cool down on Lebanon. And there will come a time where this country is less important strategically. Let it happen soon before we pass away. That's the that's the other side of it, which is I don't know when it will happen. It could happen maybe uh, for the next generation. But something happened in my lifetime. I'm going to extend it to yours. We saw a country born fall into war. We saw it born once more, fall once mm. more. Uh, we saw people that tried along the way. Many people tried. We saw too many of them die, not by natural causes, but through murder. And we saw a population demand something which never happened before, uh, demanded sovereignty, mm. demand an end to the civil war, and demand that the last group that still has weapons in this country move on. Hasn't happened yet, but the demands are not going away. So, regardless of all the difficulties, and this anniversary is always painful, um, I still like this time of the year. Uh, I'll just wrap it up by saying two things. The last time I saw Dad was at the door of this apartment Christmas evening, not Christmas Eve, the 25th at night, was leaving the when apartment. When you had the conversation about the bow. About the bow. About the bow. Bow the tie. Necktie. Yes, he was uh, flirting with going to a bow tie. Yes. Right. That was the last time I saw him at the door here, Christmas the 25th. Uh, 36 hours later or so, he was killed. Um, I'm wearing a jacket that he gave me on Christmas. Still fits. I've gotten fatter. Somehow it still fits, but it needs a bit of... Uh, I need to lose some weight to make it fit better. Um, this was the table I sat at on the 25th at night. And that's where you and I sat on the 27th at night. There's something very dramatic about that shift. This shift was uh, very, very bad. So, thank you for... The Christmas tree... The Christmas tree that was, was in the corner now it's at the entrance of the building where he resided oh that's his that's the same I was one you know it looked familiar <laughs> he decorated it oh there it's still there then I didn't know it looked familiar now I know and his red sweater that he was wearing yeah on Christmas is gone with him Yeah. Yes, yes. This is the way it is in our family and many other families. Many people are mourning like us, to each his own way of mourning. We lost our dear people. We lost our dear friends. Some people lost dear sons and daughters. Uh, fathers this is our destiny this is Lebanon Lebanon we love one can hope that things will not permanently be this bleak but I miss him uh, he's left a very big hole in our lives and uh, on that note Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Hope next year will be better than this year. I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We did it. We did it. لخدمة لبنان وخبايا لبنان لا بل أقول خبايا العرب جميعاً